I'd like to introduce Senator Gary Hart. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I've been around a while, and uh, my experience is, including my own personal experience, that virtually every presidential nomination race turns up a surprise candidate, one who is not high in the polls, may not have the most money, may not be the best known, but at a time, and usually every four years is that time, people start looking for new leadership and sort through the, in this case, wide variety of candidates uh, looking for that new leader. Uh, I was the beneficiary of that process uh, quite a number of years ago. Parenthetically, let me say that I think two-thirds of the press corps today were not even alive when I was a candidate. So, um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it does seem like a long time ago. It is great to be back. Um, I have known Michael Bennett and particularly the Bennett, extended Bennett family for almost half a century. I was a friend of his father's and uh, Michael and I have known each other well before he ran for the Senate. Uh, became a, a senator and ran for the Senate in Colorado some years back. He has, uh, as I will briefly say, an introduction uh, later today. He has the intellectual capacity, the, the experience in government at all levels, local, state, and national. Uh, he is remarkably uh, intelligent and is an internationalist. All this is going to have to be on, be at the forefront of Democrats' decision as to who will represent our party, all those factors. I per perhaps uniquely believe that the next president has an enormous repair and restoration job to put the country's domestic agenda back where it should be has been practically destroyed, and to repair and restore our international alliances around the world. When you put that job, plus moving the country forward, against the array of candidates, there are very, very few who have the qualifications to carry that job out. Uh, I must say also it's great for me to be back with a large number of friends who've remained friends over the last more than three decades. I was uh, the leader of the Hart campaign in those days was a young woman, extraordinarily capable young woman uh, named Jean. And I'm trying to remember whatever happened to her. In any case, I'll see Senator Shaheen later today. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Bennett. Thank you very much. Um, it is a, a great privilege to be here today with Senator Hart and to have his endorsement for President of the United States, and I deeply appreciate it. We've known each other uh, about a quarter of a century now, and for those of you that were here uh, covering him when he was running, it is a reminder to me of the extraordinary leadership that he uh, has pr provided our country over many, many decades, his ability to look to the future to see around corners, to not accept uh, conventional wisdom as wisdom, but to supply his own wisdom and think about the direction that the country really needed to head. And when he ran for president, he was rewarded by that by the voters in Iowa and New Hampshire. He, at a similar stage in the campaign, was at about 1% in the polls. He went on to become second in Iowa with 16%, and then one here. Uh, in New Hampshire. I think, as in those days, the voters in Iowa and New Hampshire are just beginning to look at these candidates and make up their minds about whom they want to elect. I believe strongly, and this uh, Gary Hart and I share this coming from the swing state of Colorado, I believe we need to present an agenda to the American people that's going to unify the American people around the cause of their children and America's place in the world in the 21st century. We have to be able to win these races in purple states and even some red states 
in this country, and that can't be an afterthought if we want to not just win the presidency, but win a majority in the Senate, which I think is so vital to moving this country forward and overcoming the, the blockade of our exercise in self-government that Mitch McConnell and the Freedom Caucus and Donald Trump have been such an important part of over the last 10 years. That's why I'm running for president, and that's why I'm so honored to have uh, Senator Hart's support. I, I hope that I am as fortunate as he was, but I know he never left anything to chance. It's just about putting one foot in front of the other in living room after living room and storefront after storefront in these early states where people take incredibly seriously the responsibility they have to make sure that we nominate somebody who can beat Donald Trump, can unify the country, and allow us to begin to govern again. Uh, in this country. For the 10 years that I've been in the Senate, there hasn't been much in the, in the way of governance. When I tell Gary about what we've done over the course of a given week compared to what they used to get done, it's almost laughable what we're doing there. It, we've become a factory that just approves judges day after day after day, rather than considering the domestic and national security uh, dimensions that we need to consider as a country going forward. So it is a great joy for me to be here today with my fellow Coloradan, Gary Hart. This is a great shot in the arm for our campaign, and I can't tell you, Gary, how much I appreciate you taking the trouble to be here. With that, um, I'd be happy to take any questions, and Senator Hart is here to answer whatever questions you might have for him. And maybe I'll get out of the way so you can... So he's the candidate. So, Peter. Come back, Senator Hart. <laughs> Come back. Hey, how, Senator Hart, how's the party changed in the last 35, 30, how's the party changed in the last 30, 35 years? Are you concerned about the fact that perhaps some candidates, perhaps not concerned, but have uh, gone too far to the left? How much time do we have? <laughs> as much as you want. Uh, basically, no. I don't think the Democratic Party, at its core, that is to say, the people that care about the party and its agenda day after day, week after week, year after year, uh, have changed all that much. We are a coalition party since Franklin Roosevelt, thank God, and remain so, which means that you're going to have a much wider variety of philosophies and concerns and issues than the Republicans ever will. Uh, a consensus party such as the Republican Party has been and is now almost lockstep as demonstrated by their representatives in the Senate and elsewhere uh, just follows orders. But, but <laughs> President Trump is destroying the Republican Party, at least the traditional one. They used to be uh, not only for tax cuts but for balanced budgets. There was even a time uh, not too long ago where <clears throat> Republican presidents and candidates uh, supported environmental cleanup. They've just, they've abandoned that. Uh, there is no independence on the part of Senate Republicans, and that's extraordinary. But basically to your question, uh, I think the, the, the broad base of the De uh, Democratic Party remains pretty much what it has always been. And it's been, a, a pretty wide net that permitted and encouraged a lot of different philosophies to join in. So I don't, the Republican mantra over the last 20 years has been that the Democratic Party has moved far left, and a few in your industry have, have bought the equivalence notion that while Republicans have gone far right, Democrats have gone far left. You can't find that in the eight years of Bill Clinton or the eight years of Barack Obama. Uh, if anything, they disappointed people on the far left for not being more extreme than they were. But they were mainstream presidents and, and not far left. But I, we, we in the Democratic Party welcome new ideas, new approaches, and that includes economic shakeups. Senator, Senator, Hart, uh, <laughs> Senator Hart, you, you served alongside Joe Biden for 12 years. He opposed the Iraq war, he voted for it. Could you speak to why you know, Joe Biden's premise is that he would reintroduce the country to the world, rebuild our alliances? Could you explain why you think Senator Bennett would do a better job of that than, Senator, than Vice President Biden? Um, being 
of a certain age and therefore hard of hearing. I missed part of your question. Well, uh, Joe Biden has, has um, said that he. I'm saying, have you, have you having served with Joe Biden, having disagreed with him on the Iraq War, why do you think Senator Bennett is a better position to rebuild the country than he is? Well, I've always, first of all, Joe Biden's a friend of mine. I served 12 years in the Senate with him. I know him very, very well. And I have uh, extraordinary uh, respect for him. And as I've said to him personally, uh, as much for how he has managed tragedy in his own life as how he has represented himself in, in public office. And so the fact of my support for Michael uh, is in no way a derogation of that friendship. I have long believed in what I think you could shorthand as generational politics. That is to say, old orders age and people began to look for new leadership. That was my experience. Uh, I was running against a former vice president in New Hampshire and elsewhere. And um, despite some stories that my campaign, quote, peaked in New Hampshire, it did not. I went on to win 25 caucuses and primaries, including the last biggest state in the union, overwhelmingly, California. So it was a 50 state campaign. But people at that time, those years ago, were looking for new leadership. And I think they are doing that today. Senator, Senator Hart, yeah. Senator Hart so I just want to address the, uh, the situation here in the room as far as your, uh, your campaign and just the Me Too movement. Um, just curious, as far as the uh, Me Too movement is, is concerned, what are your thoughts on it and, and how it has affected the, the Democrat Party and your campaign in, in, in the past? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I think that, uh, that I think it's affected the entire Democratic Party and affected the country in ways that are profound and good. And, um, and, and that's incredibly helpful. Senator yeah. Hart, um, Walter Shapiro from the New Republic, who covered you back in 84. Uh, how discouraging was it six months before the 84 New Hampshire primary when people said, oh, you don't have a chance, you're at 1%, 2% in the polls, why don't you give up? Um, it's, if it's going to be a race, it's going to be between Mondale and John Glenn. Yes. How do you deal with this kind of discouragement? With fortitude. <laughs> no, I, I've often said, and will say again, Seeking the presidency of the United States is one of the most difficult things, <coughs> projects any human being, man or woman, can undertake. It takes more physical, mental, spiritual determination than almost any other project anyone can undertake. And if you don't have that, you shouldn't be in the race. Mike, Michael has that fortitude. Um, the polls, by and large, it must be said, right now, our name recognition. And the vast majority of the Democratic Party nationwide are still making up their minds who they support. There is no one in this race. In my day, I think Walter Mondale was at 40 or 45 percent. My thought was 60 to 50 to 60 percent of the Democratic Party is looking for someone else. And I think you have that in this race as well. So um, a lot of decisions will be made before the votes are cast here. And you can go from, as I did, from 2% to whatever it became almost overnight um, by doing well in Iowa and New Hampshire. The two, these two states, small states, have a, both a, uh, a powerful role to play but also an extraordinarily important role. They decide, Iowa, New Hampshire, maybe one or two other states now, will decide who the serious candidates are. And so uh, I would encourage all of you not to pay too much attention to polls right now. Listen to message, uh, talk to people, and particularly for those who say I'm for Michael Bennett, ask why. And that will be the answer to the question. Senator, Senator, Senator can, I, can I follow up on, on Walter's question and kind of flip it in the other direction? Um, what would you tell a front-running candidate 
uh, at this point <laughs> heading into Iowa, New Hampshire five months from now. Don't take anything for granted. <laughs> and don't believe your own polls. You know, I, I think, I don't want to re revert to my own experience too much, but I think the front, the quote front runner, and that's by and large a determination all of you make, can often take that seriously and not work as hard as young people supporting Michael Bennett across the country are doing, and that that shows up. Sure. Yeah, um, Gary Moody, WSM in uh, Nashville. On my show, I get a, I monitor all the news and stuff. What I'm seeing is both kind of blatantly and it's subliminal is both parties seem to be trying to make the case that the other party is less American on the wrong course and that we should only have one party in charge. Yeah. Do you think your campaign yeah. is recognizing yeah. that and doing enough I, to, yeah. to bring in people to a more common uh, identity? I, I do. Thank you for that question. I, I've long believed that the idea that this is about um, substituting our preferred version of, of single-party rule for their preferred for their preferred version of single party rule is a mistake and a mis uh, and it completely uh, misapprehends how our democracy is supposed to work. We are living in an era, it's true, where we've got politics in Washington D.C. where the two parties clash and can't agree on anything so much so that our exercise in self government, as I said earlier, is immobilized. But Gary and I both represent a state that's a third Democratic, a third Republican, and a third Independent. And that creates a discipline in people that are paying attention to their work, which means I never say one thing in a primary and something else in the general election. Now, I've been interested to see that happening in this, uh, in this contest where people think that you can, you got to go to the left to begin with, and then you're going to move over to the right for the general election. That's not how we run elections in Colorado. We say the same thing in rural areas that we do in urban areas. And what I've discovered to thread a few of these questions together is that the policies that I have pursued for the last 10 years in Colorado, whether it's a public option to finish the job on the Affordable Care Act, my proposals on climate that, that uh, include the idea that we're going to use conservation in our working lands to pay farmers and ranchers to sequester carbon in their soil, the American Family Act that I've had for a number of years with Senator Brown from Ohio, which would dramatically increase uh, uh, the child tax credit and reduce childhood poverty in this country by 40 percent without adding one additional federal bureaucrat, that that's where the voters are in, in Iowa, in New Hampshire, in South Carolina. I don't have to distort where I've been to, to meet them where they are. And I think that's what I'm finding. And in the long run, what we have to do as a party is not just galvanize our base, but also unify others in this country some of the nine million people that voted for Barack Obama twice and Donald Trump once, if we're going to prevail. And then after we prevail, we have to figure out how to govern this country again. We can't spend the next 10 years in the kind of lockdown that we were for the last 10 years without being the first generation of Americans to leave less opportunity, not more to the people that are coming after us. That's what I think is at stake in this election. I think that's what's on people's mind. And how you run in a primary makes a big difference to whether you're obviously going to be able to win in general and govern the country. Senator Hart. Sorry. Senator Hart, um, do you think it's harder for someone who is less known now to get a fair look from, from the public? In, in next week, you know, we'll have another debate, and 10 of the 20 candidates won't be on that stage. Uh, there, there are two answers to your question. One is, it's easier now because of social media and a lot of other outlets that my generation did not enjoy. So in that respect, uh, it, it's easier to, quote, get your message out than it was in the old days. But on the other hand, if, if I, my experience was, I think, with six, no more than seven candidates at tops, and then narrowed down to three for most of the primaries, um, it, it, I can't imagine Michael's experience with all the candidates in this race. Things will clarify as, this, as the voters in Iowa and New Hampshire decide who is serious. And, who, and by that I mean 
not only who has the best ideas, but who can actually be present. And that focus is now so distorted and unfocused that it will require February, I guess, uh, to really decide who the serious candidates are. I, I am absolutely convinced Senator Bennett's going to be one of those. And it will be decided in those er early two or three states. And once you have established your bona fides and your seriousness in the minds of the voters, then the finances come, support comes. Uh, there's another poll that I always felt should be taken and, and never is. And that is in asking people who they support, the second question is, who's your second choice? Because as people drop out, their supporters go somewhere. They're not going to go home. And an untold story in my year, for example, was that the most famous, if not a most famous and not the most famous American, John Glenn, was considered by pundits uh, to be the real contest with Vice President Mondale. It didn't work out that way, but I think every evidence going back those many years was that virtually all the people that supported John came to my campaign. So the second choice is very, very important when that field narrows down. Senator, any reflection over the last 30 years on the mood of the electorate and, and you know what, what some of the causes of the changes have been? Well, one of the, I think Dan Boss and a few of the others of you who were around then will recall that a lot of what my so-called message was had to do with globalization, the information revolution, mass migrations, now called immigration, and I talked a lot about those as, as both opportunities and challenges for the future. That was 36 years ago. And, and you, even in living rooms in New Hampshire, you start talking about globalization. And Silicon Valley, people would, you know, I, I went for a time as some, some labeled me the Atari Democrat just because I talked about stuff like this. But then Al Gore and others made it much more mainstream. But, um, that's what's conditioned American politics. It's not what we decided to do here, but what the globe, what, what transitions were going on internationally. And those had good aspects, but they also had very bad aspects. And even in my day, I would tour the cold steel mills in Buffalo and elsewhere, and, and that's what you could see. Steel mills, auto plants shut down. And, and high unemployment, so that we're still suffering from that. Is there anybody else? One last yeah. question. One, last. one or two. Oh, one last. Sorry, Senator. Okay. Uh, do you see any parallels between when, like, I mean, in terms of like holdover support for someone like, say, Senator Sanders from the 84 primary to the 88 primary, and how that could maybe shift for a candidate who's in now, like Senator Bennett? Did you hear that? He said, from 84 to 88, holdover support for a candidate like Bernie Sanders. Yeah, um, it's one of the interesting aspects of presidential campaigns, maybe statewide also. I wouldn't say cults form, but, but strong supporters <laughs> form, and, and they coalesce, and they stay together. I mentioned earlier that I've been fortunate to have an awful lot of talented young people here in this state. That was 36 years ago. They've remained friends for almost four decades. So there is some social cohesion that campaigns bring about, and, and sometimes that becomes a cult of personality, sometimes not. It depends on the nature of the, of the candidate. I don't think it's necessarily bad. But it does mean if you're part of that, you put on blinders and you don't listen to anybody else. Right. Well, that's what, I, what I was asking is, do you, could you see them you know, migrating in the way that your supporters may have in 88? Back in the 80s? Yeah. Well, I'm trying to think. Um, Jesse Jackson was one of the finalists. 
and there was a, um, I forgot what Jesse called his movement. Anyway, Rainbow Coalition. Yeah. Rainbow Rainbow Coalition. Coalition. yeah. Yes. And, and those were very strongly adhering people to each other, and they, they brought civil rights to the forefront. Help. Okay, is there any one last question? Right to you. Hey, Senator, a quick question for you. I talked to Sue Casey, who helped run your campaign back in 84, and she mentioned that she was kind of sad to see a shift from retail politics to these large rallies we're seeing with President Trump, Senator Bernie Sanders. I wonder if you can reflect on how that changes the dynamic of the yeah. presidential primary. It's an interesting question. I don't, I don't have an answer. I, I would love to have, months before the New Hampshire primary or Iowa, addressed 10 or 12,000 people. I don't know, quite know how it's working now. I think what, uh, you can attribute that in large part to the social media. You, you can reach many, many more people with the cell phone or whatever device you have than we could um, back in those days. But I, what I recall about Iowa, New Hampshire, before the breakthrough in New Hampshire was what Michael's been doing, and that is people's living rooms and small classrooms small groups, and that's where the, the hardcore of your support comes from. And uh, even if you have the big rallies, they don't necessarily create that cohesion that's required. I would, I would just say that our, our meetings are getting bigger, not smaller, in Iowa and in New Hampshire, which I think is a sign of that we're making progress. And I, I wanted to just say a word about the polling. You know, Senator Hart talked about the second choice polling. We had one not that long ago in New Hampshire that did ask that question about second choice, and we were sixth, I think, in that poll. Uh, in the last national poll that I saw before the decisions were made on the debate stage, there were 12 of us that were polling at one. I was one of those people. Three or four of the other people that were polling at one are going to be on the debate stage. There's somebody who's polling at zero uh, in that poll who's going to be on the debate stage because of the arbitrary nature of, of what the DNC has set up. So I don't see a reason to stop based on the polls. I, what I see uh, in my travels are people that have not yet made up their mind remotely about this election. And, and I think that the, the positions that I've taken, as I said earlier, are actually quite consistent with the positions that people have in these living rooms, both in terms of what their substantive beliefs are but also what they think it's going to take to beat Donald Trump, which is the number one question on people's minds in the places that I've been here and in uh, Iowa and South Carolina. I want to thank Senator Hart again so much for being here for his endorsement. I treasure it when you are at zero or one percent in the polls. The people you will remember the most are the people who showed up and endorsed you then when it was hard, not when it was easy. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thanks to everyone. all of you. And Thank Senator Hart will be introducing Michael.